welcome to the Stronger for Business podcast with Difrig Jenkins, Pete Rushma, and myself, Bev Thurgood. Stronger for Business is a training consortium dedicated to bringing high quality training solutions to businesses through the combined expertise of our partners. From skills training to developing personal and professional excellence, our mission is to help business owners get the very best from their people at all levels, from boardroom to shop floor. The Stronger for Business podcast is our opportunity to share our knowledge, thoughts and ideas with you, the listener. You'll get to meet some awesome guests from across the business world, sharing their experience of learning and development. If you love what we have to say, make sure you hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you use to consume your podcasts so you don't miss out on future episodes. We'd love to hear from you with your suggestions for discussion topics or ideas for future guests. And if you really love what you hear, please do consider leaving us a five-star review as this helps to get the podcast out to a wider audience. Sit back and enjoy the Stronger for Business podcast. Hey, hello, everybody. Welcome to episode eight of the Stronger for Business uh, podcast. Um, I'm in the driving seat today for the first time. The first time I'm leading a podcast. It's really exciting. I'm a little bit nervous uh, <laughs> as well. So, uh, so for those of us that have um, been, or for those of you that have been listening to the podcast so far, uh, you probably know that there's uh, we. It's quite fluid um, in its in its structure, uh, but we always tend to uh, start with looking back um, at what's happened for us over, over the last week. Uh, we talk about a topic today, and the topic today is talking about what is the future for face-to-face learning now that well, a lot of us have found ourselves um, in this virtual world. And then we'll, we'll close up with some reflections our learning, um, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll move on um, into the future. So, um, hi, Bev. Hi, Pete. How are you? Hi, Dev. I'm well, thank you. What have you been up to, Bev? Um, so this week, do you know what? I haven't been out the house, I don't think. Not even for my daily walk, which is quite shocking. Um, yeah, do you know what? I'm finding it all a little bit confusing at the minute. A few weeks ago, it was very easy to know what we were meant to be doing. Mm-hmm. Um, in the UK, it was, it was you know, stay home, stay safe. And now the, the certain restrictions have been lifted. I, I feel little, I've got a little bit of anxiety, actually, about going outside and, and getting it wrong, mm-hmm. which is silly. I, I don't have any anxiety about going out and catching coronavirus that'll happen if it happens but I, yeah I just got a little bit of anxiety around oh it, it, it's a different world out there and I, I think bizarrely I'm kind of staying staying in because it feels safe to be in my little office here and mm-hmm. I can still chat to people on zoom but I need to get over this I've never ever had social anxiety so yeah a bit of a strange week for me I think mm-hmm. yeah what about you Pete yeah, I think uh, I think what you say, Bev, is going to be very, very common, very prevalent. I've had uh, I've had a bit of a strange week myself as well. I, I realised I posted on LinkedIn. It's Friday. I posted on LinkedIn today. It's the first time in God knows how long that I've that I've posted on LinkedIn. So it's first time this week. So for all all the previous weeks of lockdown for the past 10, 12 weeks, I've been posting every day on LinkedIn, uh, coming up with content. And today's the first time uh, this week, which is incredible, really. So it goes to show how busy I am. And I've, I've come up with new productivity tools uh, to make sure that I am being productive. But interestingly, it's like I signed them off to say I'm done. So I was thinking, what have I done this week? And I've done so much that it was really hard to try and remember. But um, yeah, very much for me, it's a bit like I'm back in the, I'm back in the training room, as you can hey. see from my background. Oh, wow. I'm back in the, you know, I'm back in the training room um i've got new uh i've got a new shirt so i've had some new um new shirts made uh this week and i've also had some headshots done as well so that was quite interesting and it's been interesting interacting with people more uh, face-to-face so i've done quite a bit of interacting face-to-face with different people and everyone's take on what they're comfortable with on mm-hmm. social distancing so it's really really interesting at the moment going out and starting to do a bit of business again sort of face-to-face with people is this a, br- a bit of a rebrand then, Pete, for you, is it? Or is it just an update of the, the wardrobe? 
Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, it, it is actually it is actually a bit of a rebrand. So uh, the business started out as flagship trucks. We then um, ran dual branding with flagship trucks and training, and now we're we're sort of dropping dropping trucks and training to flagship uh, because we're uh, we're, we're going to be doing training still, uh, and obviously still in this massive part of our business. But actually, we're taking on some more consultative work as well uh, around health and safety and human resources so we're going to be flagship partners uh, as a bit of a rebrand that's going to be relaunching later this month which is probably why my head is all over the place because there's so much to do mm -hmm. fantastic no that's brilliant it's great to see you back in the training room as well i can't wait to get my foot back in into the classroom so yeah it's, mm. yeah, it's, it's really exciting that, yeah it's interesting that you're evolving your brand as well so the business is it's still reasonably young isn't it as a as a business uh, but it's right. important that you're evolving the brand and that there's a need to do that and you're kind of thinking constantly about about the future um so it, it makes sense to, to you about your kind of proposition as a business but it makes sense to to quite a wide uh, customer group as well. yeah 100 percent. it's been a really interesting week which i suppose leads in leads in well to the conversation topic today so i was here quite till quite late we'd uh, we'd previously got rid we'd got a big boardroom table which we used in the training room for people and a lot of the training we do is practical particularly first aid and uh, we'd actually ended up getting rid of the the table and uh, and i would dismantled it i'd put it away for safekeeping and actually i was here till quite late the other day bringing it back and actually putting it back up um because it's a natural it's a natural social it's distancing tool barrier yeah. yeah yeah it's a natural social distancing tool so yeah it leads in well to the conversation today Dove. yeah it's really yeah. interesting um it's funny Bev, you're talking about the the anxiety about, about going out i've actually got quite comfortable being at home and, and like a, a lot of um people especially um <laughs> small businesses you know we take we can work from home if, if we choose to um but yeah, it's, it's quite interesting about actually what, what's it going to feel like to go out? And then, you know, if you do drive somewhere to the supermarket into a different town and you go, well, actually, everything's still there. You know, nothing physically has changed in the environment, really, has it? Um, but I was talking to some friends last night because uh, we had plans, are planning to go to Italy for two weeks. And of course, when all COVID started, Italy was the, the epicenter, if you like, in, in Europe. Um, and that was a challenge. We didn't think that we were going to go. Uh, we socially distanced in our friends' gardens last night, which is always really weird. You can't shake hands and, and hug and you know, all that kind of stuff. It's still a little bit weird after all this time. And we're having this conversation about do we now go on holiday or not? Because it's getting quite time critical because it's about 10 weeks away. We don't know if the airline's going to fly there. We don't know how it's safe it's going to be on the, on the plane or not. So actually, it's really interesting that we've got to where we are. But now there's almost, it's a different kind of anxiety about what the next couple of months are going to be like. And actually, are we going to do the right thing? You know, there, there's lots of people who are absolutely doing the right thing. There's lots of people out there that are potentially not doing the right thing as well. But it's just but, where do you find yourself I kind of navigate through that? It's, yeah, it's really yeah, quite a range of emotions again. That's exactly the problem that I think I'm got, I've got in, in, in my sort of head, this conflict between what if I think I'm doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. But I go out and I'm chastised in some way for getting it wrong, that there's some sort of protocol or etiquette that I've skipped because I missed one of Boris's or, or one of his um, colleagues, you know, five o'clock um, briefings. And, and I've because it seems to be changing day by day. And uh, there's just this fear. Maybe I'm just not a rule breaker. I always thought I was a bit of a rule breaker, but maybe I'm not. Maybe I don't like, you know, being put in a position. I think this as well, there's been a lot of griping and division on social media and a lot of almost sort of name calling when people have got it wrong and there's the whole dominic cummings thing whatever your views on that you know some people think he just made a he made a, a judgment call based around his family and you know maybe it wasn't the best judgment call but it was done with good intent and other people are absolutely vilifying him for you know for just being a blatant you know blatantly um flouting the rules and i think for me it's that anxiety between what if I think I'm getting it right and I go out there and I turn into the next Dominic Cummings, you know, and I'm, I'm, <laughs> but it, 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 okay. So I'm a bit over the top there, but there's definitely a bit of a resistance in me and it's making it harder to get out every day. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I need to, I, I need to not let that take hold. I need to kind of move up, move out yeah. of that before it becomes an issue. Cause you two know me, I am not, you know, I don't have social anxiety in any way, shape or form. I have no problem getting out there. And actually, I love 
I used to, you know, I love being on the road and I love going to different places and meeting new people. So it's a bit of a, yeah, a little bit of a, a challenge for me at the minute. I'm, uh, there's a lot going on in the head. It's, it's, inter it's interesting. Sorry, isn't it fascinating, Dominic Cummings? We spoke about him two weeks ago on the podcast, yeah. and he was like, really and, then it erupted. Him. and then it just erupted. I felt like Mystic Meg. I felt so <laughs> special. <laughs> I felt very ignorant when you mentioned his name because I didn't know his name then. And maybe this whole debacle is to make sure that I understand who he is. There we go. Exactly. It's all about you, Bev. What I'd, Always. What, <laughs> what I'd say is. You know, we had we had a supplier come into the training room this week, which was really interesting. Um, a guy called Dan Photographer. We were having some headshots done for the website, for the new website, and Maggie and I were coming in, and it was just we had to be so thoughtful about how we did it. And he came up to he came up to the training room. I'd unlocked it. He came up, set every, set all his equipment up, and then he came down to us, wait, waiting downstairs to say, "I'm ready now." So then Maggie went up and had her photos taken. She came down, and then I went up. And usually we'd have all been in there together, just having a chin wag and have a conversation, and it wouldn't have been any issue at all. And during that time, I I spoke to him and said how do you feel about things? Because actually we all feel differently. And are you comfortable with this? Is it what you expected? Because he, he, a comment he made to me was, I'm surprised how many people are here. This is the, our training rooms in a big shared building and there's other businesses here too. And I was quite wary of the fact that I'd said to him that the, biz, the, the, the buildings reopened and that maybe his expectation was that he'd come here and it'd just be us here. So how how clearly do we need to communicate with other people now moving forward as to if they agree to an engagement outside of their home, what the expectation is going to be of how busy that's going to be and whether they're comfortable with it beforehand. Are we leading them into something that they feel uncomfortable with? It was just something that we were considering and talking about. It's quite yeah, interesting. I think that's really important because, um, you know, with different people, they might be healthy and not in a high risk group, but they might have some family members you know, or people that live in their own home. <laughs> that suddenly, potentially, and inadvertently, we could be um, exposing them to, to some risk. Um, and it'd be really embarrassing all around if you invited somebody in and they said, well, actually, I can't come in because of X or Y reason, and then, uh, you know, especially in business as well. Yeah, I've, I've, I've got my, maybe my, my last virtual um, um, beer night with, with, with mates um, next week. We're, we're hoping it'll be the, the last monthly virtual one. I think, you know, between now and and this time next month, I think it could be very, very different again. So should we, should we crack on with the topic then? Because we've, yeah. we've kind of danced around. We have around. diversified a bit. Yeah, we, we have. Yeah, but we've kind of danced around a little bit, but, it, but it's, it's all relevant. So like you said, today's topic is uh, what is the future of face-to-face um, of -face learning? And, and is there a future for it? And the topic's been around for a number of years, though, even when I, I, when I was in corporate roles, which is four, four and a half years ago now, you know, people were talking about it then. And I think to, to start it off, just to help us context it and then for people listening as well. I don't go to some numbers. Pete knows that I like my numbers. We had, we had, a, we had a podcast, which maybe we'll talk about um, later. So it's, um, and these are quite recent numbers. So um, I've had a look um, and it says that online education is estimated to reach 325 billion US dollars by 2025. So that's the size of, of the market um, globally. And that, that is um, a huge amount of money. Um, and since the, um, the last kind of financial recession that we had, uh, global workplace training industry w was really hit there, you know, face-to-face -face and uh, virtually as well. Uh, but I've looked at different numbers, and of course, depending on which site you look at, that there's different numbers. But it's estimated that the size of the um, e-learning industry, and that's it, that in, in this broadest um, sense, is anything between 240 billion and 370 billion US dollars. Uh, and that's just the e-learning, a virtual learning um, industry without everything that, that happens uh, face to face. So it's a huge industry um, globally and, and we are part of that. A lot of our listeners will be part of that or at least there'll be customers of, of that as well. So, and interestingly as well, when, when you do the, um, the, the research, it's almost like face to face versus virtual rather than face to face and virtual. So mm -hmm. it's just, it's almost like the two markets if you like are in competition with, with each other and, and in a lot of respects they are rather than working in um, collaboration with each other uh, which is quite interesting and it and what's also interesting to observe is there's not a lot of statistics out there for face-to-face -face. so as, as an industry the face-to-face -face stuff isn't kind of marketing itself and saying this is what we're worth and the value that we add 
whereas the um, the e-learning industry or the virtual industry is is highly competitive um, and, and very monetized and money orientated and they are really positioning themselves in the market and i'm not saying that's right or wrong but it's just a really interesting observation were those figures related to um b2c training or b2b uh, it, training or was it not broken down because you've broken. got the likes of udemy 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 i never know how to say it udemy and those are the sort of learning platforms that are really they're, they're kind of b2c platforms aren't they mm. um, it'd be interesting to know what the breakdown between of, of that that sort of number is in terms of business training and personal training yeah, what I would also have loved to have seen, and, and I must admit, I, I'm sorry, guys, I've been really remiss. I haven't had a lot of chance to do any research around today. So you're just going to get my opinion with no, absolutely no, no backing <laughs> <laughs> whatsoever. But it would be really interesting to look at the, um, the effectiveness in terms of, I mean, when, when, whenever you deliver any kind of learning, the objective is to create change in yeah. some way, whether that's a, a change in skill, skill level, a change in knowledge, a change in behaviour. Uh, ultimately, I think it's that behaviour change that, that we're looking for. And it would be interesting to know the effectiveness of purely online learning on behaviour change. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting, actually, because um, I, I've, I've read with an open mind um, what, what people have been writing. Uh, and it's again, it's interesting because the the people who are writing blogs and websites, especially providers, uh, have got a very strong case uh, for for virtual learning. But there are some spurious claims out there um, as well about how beneficial um, it really is. Um, and I read um, that social learning. So this is people learning from each other, but in a virtual environment, and in that uh, traditional environment as well, accounts for about seventy five percent of, of informal learning. Um, and I think that's something to, to talk about as, as we go through uh, this podcast is, you know, virtual learning in its broader sense. It's not just sitting in front of an e-learning module, clicking next, next, answering a few questions. It's the, it's the whole kind of social learning and online collaboration and, and things like that as well. Um, but, but there's one line which I read literally just before we started the podcast. And it says the social learning like group learning and face to face interactions is now very outdated. And oh, really? Yeah, I thought, well, that, that, that's, that's quite a, a big claim. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, so maybe we can start to pick through that because that is the, the subheading, I suppose, for the, uh, the, for the subject of, of today. Yeah, I like, I mean, going back to what you said earlier about the idea that there, there's almost a, this sort of us and them mm. around virtual learning and face-to-face -face learning. And, you know, I, for me personally, I know I think I learn best when there's a more blended approach. So... Mm. Uh, a, a blend of virtual learning and face-to-face -face. but I think for me the the, the benefit of face-to-face -face, and I will always be an advocate of face-to-face -face, I totally disregard that last comment that you were, that you read out mm -hmm. the, the benefit for me in face-to-face -face is the time outside the classroom rather than the time just inside it it's the the coffee breaks and the, if you're you know if you're on a, maybe a residential course it's the meeting up with your, de your, your fellow delegates in the you know, in the bar later on, and it's that reinforcing of what you've learned through conversation that I, I, I wouldn't, I don't have a percentage for it, but I would say the percentage is high in terms of the learning, you know, where the learning comes from, whether it's from the, the sitting in the classroom or, or actually the, the, the peripheral learning, if you mm -hmm. like, that you get from the interactions with, with the other people on the course. And I think, you know the, the, that blended approach with 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 some virtual learning um, and and some face to face, it it kind of it, it's a better a, a, a broader way to meet all of those different learning preferences as well, isn't it? You know, if you've got people who need a little bit more time, the e learning is brilliant because you can go over it again and again and again uh, until it's it, until it's embedded in in, in you which you can't necessarily do if you've got a, you know, a one day workshop, uh, if you, you know, you switch off for five seconds and you've lost the thread mm. and you don't want to put your hand up and say, I switched off. I, I've missed all that. At least a bit with e-learning, you can kind of go back and reinforce it. Mm. So I hope and pray that face-to-face -face learning isn't dead, not just because, you know, I quite enjoy delivering it, but also I think there's so much, more to be gained 
from that that sort of face to face and that, that it, those interactions that you don't get um, through a Zoom call or you know through that kind of virtual training, even if it's live virtual training. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Pete? Because you're just saying that you brought your your, your big table back into into your yeah. Place. So it, it, do you know what? It's quite it's quite exciting to see what's going to happen. Really, I think um, to give to give people a little bit of background with the training that we deliver. So we've been doing blended training for a long time. Um, and we've, we've got a suite of online e-learning courses, which are predominantly, uh, predominantly sort of health and safety and mandatory oriented, but there are some business skills in there. Um, now from a first aid point of view, uh, we've been doing blended learning for, for a while. Um, both the mandated paediatric Ofsted registered first aid training for, for paediatric um, staff. So whether that be teachers or nursery staff, uh, carers, childminders, etc. Uh, their 12 hour course for Ofsted approval um, historically would be two days in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, our competitors still offer that. But we have been in a position for a while now where we've offered a blended course where it's only one day in the classroom to reduce contact time and an online course. Now, they've loved that for ages um, with, with us because from a productivity point of view, that supports their productivity and their businesses because they need less time away. They can do the online course at a time convenient to them. Um, and then they come in and then we do practical skills with them, which we need to do face to face. Yeah. Um, and, and that isn't changing. The resource council from a first aid point of view have been very, very clear that first aid needs to be practiced in, you know, in person and needs to be done. So um, it's interesting. We've been doing it for a while from a blended point of view with our driver CPC training. Um, that was always mandatorily face to face. However, the DVSA approved that about two months ago at the beginning of lockdown. They approved that for going online and going virtual via Zoom. And the feedback is that that's gone OK. And it came up for review this week. Um, it was up for review and they've now authorized it indefinitely online. However, they are also looking at bringing it back into the classroom too. So it's very, very interesting for us to see what's happening. When it initially came out as a, as a potential for Zoom, uh, I, I decided against it because I felt it was temporary. And actually the businesses that I cater to weren't in a position to be able to invest with all the uncertainty. Uh, they had a lot of overhead, staff furloughed, et cetera. And it felt wrong for me to then go and say that I'll deliver the training that I did previously and do it via Zoom. Uh, so I, I, I stepped out of that and said, I'll wait for it to go back into the classroom. Um, however, I'm now in a position where things are returning to normal, but actually that is now an option indefinitely. So that is something that I need to explore. But interestingly, I've been going through, so we're ready for training. We've actually got our first face-to-face -face training next Tuesday uh, for first aid. Uh, usually in a first aid setting, you're allowed up to 12 people. Uh, Next week, we've got two. <laughs> we've only got two in a room which would normally have 12. So it's a very safe place to start. And the benefit we've got is they're both from the same company. So they're colleagues who would normally be working together anyway. And we're going to their location. We've trained there previously. But just to give you guys a picture of the risk assessment that I've done to, to do that, there, there's several steps that have had to change from what we would do normally. So we've introduced a two meter distancing rule. There's now a PPE kit for all the delegates that they, they need to have. Um, all the first aid delegates will also receive their own bandage and dressing kit, which we would have shared previously. Um, I've had to increase the accessibility to hand washing facilities. Uh, we've amended ways of working to ensure physical distancing is observed. For example, putting the desk back up, putting the tables back up um, and, and using that as well. We're also looking at um, plastic uh, roller banners, see-through roller banners. Mm -hmm. So they're a fantastic solution for training because they're movable and wipe downable, but people can still see through them. So we're exploring that as a solution at the moment as well. Um, amended ways of working to ensure physical distancing is observed. Uh, we've got temperature checking, so we've just invested in the forehead scanners. Um, we've gone from paper to paperless documentation, so they're going to have to bring up their own smart device to be able to do the test and the exam. Um, and, and there's going to be no physical handouts. Uh, and then I've had to put a process in place for cleaning down all the equipment after use. And obviously we've got the reduced capacity overall. So there's quite a bit going on. So yeah. then I look at it from a business point of view as well. First aid, for example, is very competitive. I've now increased my overheads per delegate 
and I've decreased my capacity significantly. Now, from a pricing point of view, I'm on a day rate with this place that I'm going to train at on Tuesday. But actually moving forward, I need to work out how I'm going to manage that from an open course point of view as well. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very topical, really. I think certainly for us at the moment, face-to-face -face training is going to continue. Um, again, we've always explored that there's, there's online solutions too. And actually, I think... In reality, my position is, is I think that there's going to be both, but I do think we're going to reduce face-to-face -face learning. I think that is a long-term outcome. Um, and I think that, you know, a good example would be we've got online courses, for example, which cover the theory around even professional development courses, for example, around presentation skills, for example. I've got a presentation skills online learning, which could be delivered as pre-work to a course, which could then reduce a longer course to a shorter contact, face-to-face -face contact and maybe smaller groups because the theory has been done prior and therefore it's all about the implementation in the face-to-face. -face. Mm. So, um, yeah, interesting times. Sorry, I've gone on. but no, that's we're really living, good. We're, we're living it right now, you know, it's, yeah. it's yeah. mad really. I think that, you know, what, you're, what you've just talked about there is so relevant because, you know, when, when we're trying to price training, pricing is always the trickiest thing anyway. And I think sometimes it's difficult for um for for clients to understand why the price of training is is often as it is because they see you there for three hours they they look at an hourly rate but we don't we don't train on an hourly rate that's you know we might be stood in front of the class for three hours but that doesn't you know that doesn't include the the hours of prep that's gone into it and, and in your case obviously the overheads of um, having to put all those extra sort of um, risk factors in, in place. Risk factors? Yeah. Anti-risk yeah. factors? Yeah. Um, yeah, preventative action. It's pre preventative measures, isn't it? Preventative if the yeah. risks. Better way to put it. it. Which brings me on to kind of another question, really, about the, the, the pricing around virtual versus um, in-person training. Should there be a difference in price? Because ultimately... Um, the the you won't have obviously travel costs and 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 um, subsistence costs or anything like that to tag on to the the cost of the, the the training but ultimately the content is still the same it still takes as long to prepare it still takes as long to research it. um but there seems to be this feeling that we need to reduce our prices when it's virtual training mm. What are your, what are your thoughts? I, I think the, the discussion point here to, um, to elaborate, I guess, is that we have a choice, don't we? Whether it's virtual, whatever, whatever that looks like. Um, I always feel, sorry, I feel really rude because I'm sat in the living room. The postman passes me every time I do this podcast and he waves and he's a really nice guy, but I, <laughs> I, I'm really trying to focus on, on the session. Uh, so I, the next time I see him, I'm going to say, I'm not being rude, but I'm just focusing because I'm recording a, a podcast. Um, Maybe you should invite him on as a guest. <laughs> we could do that. <laughs> oh, it's not have to socially distance though. That's, that's the problem. Uh, maybe get one of those plastic screens you were talking about, Pete. Um, yeah. so going back to, going back to the topic is, um, the fact that you know we have a choice whether it's face to face the traditional learning or whether it's um, virtual is that do we have an off the shelf product or do we have something tailored, and and yeah. and the price point of those things I think should be different, um, and you know there is definitely a time when you have off the shelf you know like so some Pete's um, sessions I've I've seen them I've, I've sampled them it's really good quality, uh, and but those are off off the shelf and that's fine for some people but for other people it needs to be a little bit more tailored so I think you know as as you would be. Um, with, you know, if you are a traditional provider and you're delivering something that's, that's fairly standard and the, and the client or the customer doesn't want it to be tailored, then that might have a different price point. Um, so I suppose it's, it's very easy to say for this, it'll be this price, for that, it'll be that price. Um, my view is we should always, nearly always, tailor to the content, uh, so the context mm -hmm. of the organisation that we're working in. Uh, but, you know, if you're doing something like as an example, a health, easy example, a health and safety e-learning module. We're talking about, um, let's say, lifting uh, as an example. That is what it is wherever you go. Um, and that doesn't need to be tailored because you're just complying to your country's um, health and safety um, uh, legislation, essentially. So, you know, so that, that doesn't need to be tailored. But I think when you're talking, especially like Bev, you were talking earlier about behaviour change. 
that behavior changes within the context of that company or that or that business or that organization and the culture that's that's in there as well so that that's that's not an it's not an easy um question to answer i don't think well i i was thinking more of like for like so if you're delivering exactly the same content but you're delivering either virtually or face to face so the content is exactly the same it's just the delivery method that's different mm. there seems to me to be an expectation that the price for that virtual delivery will be lower than face to face delivery mm. taking away any of the sort of the peripheral costs that you know the travel and, and, and overnight subsistence yeah. and that kind of thing so I, I think my my question was really about like for like I, I get exactly what you're saying if it's off the shelf then you would expect it to not be as expensive as a tailored mm -hmm. um, bespoke training package but ultimately i'm talking about just the same content but delivered in in, in via two different mediums mm. so my thoughts are the price should be the same you know because you're delivering the same outcome mm -hmm. or you're you know you should, um, and i guess the question is a bit deeper than that is can you affect the same outcome virtually as you can face to face and therefore is the outcome going to be as good virtually? Mm. In which yeah. case should the price reflect that? And, and you don't oh. pay just for that one hour or three hours, perhaps you're paying for the experience of the individual or the company that's providing that. So as an example, you know, most providers, you know, either individually or collectively, have got a numbers, a number of years experience behind them, which allows them to do that effectively. So you're not just paying for that, okay, I'm gonna buy you for an hour or three hours or whatever it might be actually buying the experience and the the skill that that comes with that as well because you know when you're creating or curating content whether that's virtual or, or face to face there's still skill there's still overheads from the from the provider's perspective but you know if, if you are designing e-learning content and you're doing that well or video content and mobile content whatever it might be you know there's there's still skill that needs to be you're paying for the skill on the and the experience as well so i think i think it's a really good question there's so many constituent parts, isn't there, to development and training. So you've got the IP element, which is the what we're contributing to to whatever that course material is when it's being written. And you so you've got that's a cost. I believe that's a cost that should be charged for. That's IP that we know, as well as any research that is required to to complete that. And then and then on top of that, We've also got the consideration of the person's experience as well. And the only thing that, or the only tangible thing that in my head to liken that to is when you go for someone for public speaking, there's public speakers out there that charge £20,000 a speech, £50,000 a speech, £10,000 a speech, etc. And at some point they've had to decide on that based on their experience, what's happened to them, the results they've had, etc. And none of that changes whether we're virtual or not. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been in a position recently where the driver CPC training has gone online and I've seen my competitors drop their per person prices whilst also being impacted by capacity because the, the perception is, is that if you go online, the benefit you've got is you can increase capacity because you've, you're not bounded by a classroom. However, they were bounded by the legislation and they dropped their prices and it was just absolutely ridiculous when you look at them being ca capped at five people uh, per, per day and then, and then the, the prices they were dropping to per person. I couldn't employ a trainer uh, to, to be able to do that. Um, and ab absolutely not at all. And so I think there is a, the, as Bev quite rightly says, I think we perceive there's an expectation around uh, our clients expecting a reduced rate and at the moment i'm i'm in the process where i'm tendering for mental health training and we've got an off-the-shelf training solution which i can deliver either virtually or in person and they're very keen to have that for understandable reasons as well particularly with mental health they want that in person where if if at all possible now um it's very very important that interactional part but actually in the face-to-face -face learning are, is it us as trainers? So here's a question, us as trainers, because if there's a perception that we should charge less if we're virtual, yes, we've not got the cost of a, a room, for example, but often we're training in-house at, at other people's locations, so we've not got the cost of that anyway. Now, the, if there's a, a benefit 
to learning face to face. That's normally driven by the other delegates in the room and then them sharing experiences, which is actually not something that we're bringing. We're bringing the ability to make them to inter them inter to interact. Mm -hmm. So actually, should there even be a price difference at all? And in in my opinion, I don't think they should. Yeah. Well, I don't think they should either. Um, I, I think, think all aligned on that <laughs> No, I think if you're yeah. delivering in person, it's, it's very different if you've got an e-learning package, it's pre-recorded package, yeah. it's a click and learn, you know, click and watch. Um, but if, if you're there as a, a trainer or a facilitator facilitating the learning, whether that's virtual or whether that's in person, the quality of the outcome is, is really, I think, what what is important and, and you talked about IP and you, you know, the, the, the skill of the facilitator um, is, is what I think is most important. Mm. I do think there is an element of learning lost from um, virtual training that you, it's, it's that sort of intangible. It is, as I said earlier, it's the learning that happens outside of the, the classroom, you know, during lunch break, tea break and, and that kind of thing. And I don't know that you can always get the same level of interaction mm. on a video call as you can, because, because you're missing some of the nuances, you're missing some of the body language, you're, you're missing some of the, the, the side conversations that go on. Yes, you can put people into syndicate rooms or meeting rooms and, and do things that way. But what, as a facilitator, if you've got people in small groups, you can see, you're kind of picking up things all of the time. Whereas I don't think you've got that virtually. So I think I'm just talking myself around to thinking that maybe it shouldn't be the same price on that. That's worrying me. Um, yeah, but there's, there are, there's a lot of things sort of that, that are, you're, you're picking up as a facilitator in the classroom that I think you possibly lose mm. virtually. I just want to go back. To, okay. much. Yeah. yeah. I've got back to the point that Pete just, just talked about cost. And I think there's a, real danger potentially that regardless of who the provider is or how they go about to that we end up into going into a price war um and i think that'd be really dangerous so um as you guys know and some of the listeners will know as well so it's been a long time in the holiday industry and during the time i was in there it was like you know the industry a whole industry like a lot of other industries goes into a price war and we all know what happens with you know if it's in retail you know there's always three or four sales um a year um, and now we've been influenced in the UK as a lot of the rest of Europe has around the uh, kind of um, Black Friday, but two, was it a month before Christmas? And all the prices crash and then they go back up again. But then all the, um, what well, used to be the New Year's sales now start happening the day after Christmas um, in the UK. So nobody's really buying anything at full price anymore, which really has really hit the retail industry massively because they went into a price war with each other. And the problem is, is once one starts, everybody else has to do it. So the consumer wins. Or are they, uh, I guess, but, you know, as, as an industry, and then again, go back to the holiday industry, you know, prices were getting slashed quite heavily. So in the UK, traditionally holidays would get sold after, um, after New Year, uh, and then prices would get um, slashed quite, quite heavily. And one business started to do that, and then everybody else had to compete. And then all of a sudden, you know, for margin then uh, for, the, um, for, for the businesses, then really, really gets squeezed. But I think also then when your margin is squeezed, the quality of your product is getting squeezed as well. Uh, so I think, you know, initially the consumer, the, the customers potentially might win because they, um, they're, the fees they're paying come down, but actually the quality of the learning in the longer term then gets reduced as well. So I think that's, that's a real red flag for the industry and for the customers as well. But, you know, if we start going to get into a price war about regardless of what it is or how it's delivered, I think that that's something to be, to be aware of. In my previous job role, you know, I had a sizable training budget. It was, it was a six figure training budget that I was responsible for. Um, you know, and, and I, I'm quite, I'm not tight. Some people might say I'm quite tight. My family might say prudent, I'm prudent is, is a much better word. I'm cautious. Um, and, and we nearly always finish the year um, ju just about cl clearing the, the, the amount every year. Uh, but, you know, you have to be quite, quite careful. And it's interesting. Pete was talking earlier about, um, no, so for especially for your mandatory compliance kind of learning and all businesses need to have qualified first aid people within in their organization so you know there might be an expectation that uh, for, you know, the fees or uh, for whatever it might be might be coming down as you go into a virtual world but the reality might be you know if i was um, in a in a corporate again and i had a training budget 
actually my cost for first aid training might actually now be going up, particularly in, in the short term, maybe for the rest of this financial year, because I can only put two people on a first aid training course rather than eight, maybe. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm doubling my prices, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I've yeah. got to do. And even then, the margin, I've done a cost analysis, even then the margin isn't going to be as good as it was before, because when you're charging per person, it's driven by capacity. Can we can we re say that little bit? I, uh, your the the screen froze, Pete. So um, from when you said I'm doubling my prices, can you go back to that and we'll edit that bit in? Okay. So I'm doubling my prices, um, and and the reason for that is that because we've got an increased cost per person, but it's mostly due to capacity. When we've had to reduce to a third capacity that it, even by doubling, if I do a cost analysis, uh, I'm still going to be challenged by that. But I think what I need to be most careful of is how well I communicate that to my clients who are buying, because I think, I think they'll understand. I, I believe the right clients will understand that that's what they need to do to get quality training. Um, and, and that that's the, 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 the challenges that we now face as an industry. But I think my concern is, is I, I feel that particularly yours, your concerns will be, and, and, and the concerns for any trainer is that other people who are also tendered for that business probably haven't considered the impact that it can have on, on everyone if we start to slash costings and pricing, mm -hmm. and it has an impact on the overall marketplace. Yeah. It is about holding your nerve, I think, and, and, and having absolute confidence and faith in the ability to provide the outcome mm. and therefore holding your, you know, your nerve on, on the price and, and not overcharging. I'm not talking about, you know, being rid ridiculously greedy. I don't mean that, but being realistic about the, the cost uh, and the benefit, the, 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 um, the, the, the transition or the transformation that your training can create. And I think there is a danger that people are going to panic and feel like they have to start cutting their prices, especially if it is going more virtual. Um, and, and like you say, Dev, everything kind of gets reduced and reduced and reduced, but quality has to suffer um, at the end of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it will, it will go full circle. I'm sure it will. If that does happen, it, it will go full circle, but it would be so much better if we could avoid that that drop in quality and, mm. and have, you know, have people hold, hold their confidence in the, in the pricing that they're charging. And, and as you say, Pete, being able to clearly articulate the reason why we're not going to drop prices um, because, you we know, can't. because, <laughs> well, true. because we can't, if, if we want to stay in business, we, we've got to be realistic about what we charge. And also I think there's a, 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 a tendency that if we do start dropping our prices we devalue mm -hmm. the quality of the training anyway mm -hmm. and for our customers as well is you know when they um you know for, for many uh, they'll be in a new financial year now um and in you know for most organizations and businesses training is one of the first things that gets cut i mean training in its broadest um, sense um, you know like marketing and communication mm -hmm. and, and things like that which is absolutely counterproductive uh, from an organizational development perspective, but, you know, but that's, that's the way that it is because it's, it's an easy way to, to save money. Uh, but I think, you know, for, for future planning, um, you know, because people, as, as we go into the summer, we'll be kind of halfway through the year, um, financial year, and then start to forecast what they might need to spend in, in, a few, in the future as well. So I think it's, there's, like many things at the moment, there's lots of things to think about when you start to forecast from your, from your business spend, you know, if you have a, a learning and development budget or whatever it might be, and, and maybe you start to talk to your suppliers and thinking, what do you see are the challenges going to be for the future? Rather than maybe sitting there independently thinking, right, I've got my spreadsheet in front of me, I'm sitting with my finance partner. Um, and sometimes, again, you need a kind of crystal ball because you don't always know what it is that you need to be spending your money on in the future. But, but maybe for for corporate um, customers or organizations, actually start talking to your, to your suppliers uh, and start to think about, you know, what are the challenges? What is it I need to consider of, as part of my financial planning for, for my training budget um, in the future? Because it, it'll change, maybe not massively, but where you spend now, you might not be spending there, you might be spending somewhere else. So will their, uh, their budgets need to increase or decrease or stay the same? I don't know, but, but probably just have those conversations, I, I think, for, for the longer term, for the next financial year. Um, and, and the year after that. I suppose, I think mean, there's a danger um, 
that that the the, the number crunchers look and go oh we can have this virtually and it's going to cost us much less than having it face to face let's just look at the numbers and, and mm. not actually looking at the the, the transformation or the, the the change that they're actually looking to get um, and i'm guessing that's you know that's always been the case hasn't it yes, but, yes it has yeah. been <laughs> so shall we use this opportunity then to move away from the the, the finances because I, I think i think we're comfortable that we've we've, we've raised that, yeah. that red flag um, and then start to think about actually you know what is the the value or, or return on investment um, if you like you know going back to the question is there um, will there be a f place for face to face and learning in the future um, and is it one versus the other or is it um, those two things uh, depending on the, the need I guess because that's something I always used to talk about is that somebody said oh, we have to do this training for my team or my department or this function so my question is why going back to the why question why, why do you need to do it what is the need do you want to do it um, but actually let's just get into the detail and actually understand what, what the need is yeah, and, I, and you know, I do like I, I I do like the fact that I think the the whole lockdown COVID nineteen stuff has got people thinking in a different way. They've, it's got people more comfortable with technology. It's got trainers and facilitators more comfortable with the online environment. It's got um, it's got attendees more comfortable with that 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 um, platform. So I think in terms of how we how we look at training going forward. I think there's definitely a place for both. Um, mm -hmm. I genuinely think there is still a need for face-to-face -face training, but I think there's a, a, a there's a, a great opportunity to be more innovative, um, innovative rather, innovative, innovative in the way that we deliver the content. So maybe we don't need to be going in if we've got a six-month program. Maybe we don't need to be going in every month. Maybe we can do a blend of both. I mean, I did my degree. Uh, a few years ago with Edinburgh Napier University and they used to send a lecturer down once a month to do a workshop but actually um, we had another lecturer who did everything online and I'm talking so, so five or six years ago and the university had it it was a work-based degree and they had that down brilliantly mm -hmm. but I think looking back we needed both um, and interestingly as a cohort we formed our own study group because of that social learning, that, that, that outside of the classroom learning that you get. Um, so I think my, my hope is that we won't go from one extreme to the other. We will innovate and create a blend of both, uh, yes. which is already being done, but maybe more um, trainers and facilitators and companies and businesses will embrace that blended approach. Yeah. I had um, on, on LinkedIn, this advert came up. It was only yesterday, actually. Uh, with uh, one of the major universities um, in England uh, offering a high impact uh, leadership course. Uh, the price point is about two and a half thousand pounds plus half, uh, probably, uh, for a something like a 60 day um, uh, course, uh, probably about 10 hours, eight to 10 hours a week um, of, of study time. Um, and, you know, it was very valid. It, it looked great. It's very nicely packaged, um, as, as you'd expect. But I thought to myself, so we're talking about leadership but you're doing that by yourself. And, and there's it's a, a there's theory, a, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And there is an irony in there because, you know, when you are a leader, you're not leading things, you are leading people. Um, and, you know, it's, it wasn't ridiculously expensive because it, it was giving you an, an insight into leading high impact, high impact leading in today's world. So, you know, it talked about VUCA environments and, and things like that as well. You know, but for me, the concern is uh, that, you know, can you learn to be a leader um, when you're not having those kind of discussions and it doesn't have to be residential and it doesn't have to be a whole day uh, or, or, you know, the more traditional five days away um, in a hotel or whatever it might be. But I'm just wondering how transferable, because this is what we talk about when you're learning, is how we transfer that learning and apply that learning. Um, and, you know, how, how sticky is, is the learning, I, I guess, is, is the term. Um, and now how useful is a 60-day course on leadership when you're not actually talking with other leaders? Um, yeah. and, and you know that is and that's not a criticism i think it's, it's it's just a question but then you know to balance that out again a bit of research uh, that, that i've read up on today says e-learning can boost knowledge retention between 25 and 60 uh, percent and, and I, I don't doubt that but i, but I suppose it depends what e-learning that is i've certainly done compliance learning e-learning before where it's the same thing every year and you just click the button because you know the answer because you do it every year yeah. 
and you don't yeah. learn anything from that. Well, you could say there is knowledge retention there, but it's not in, you're not learning anything new. You're just doing it because you have to do it for compliance reasons. But there's other e-learning which can be really interesting and really creative as well. But I suppose it's, it's going back to why are we doing the learning and actually thinking about what the outcomes are at the start of the design or the commission um, or, or whatever it might be. Um, and actually, actually understanding what is it that we really want to get um, out of that learning, regardless of whether it's face-to-face, -face, uh, mobile, social, or, or a blend of all of those things. Can you believe we're at the hour mark already? Yeah, very nearly. Wow. So... It flies by, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, yeah. <laughs> this is probably one of the, the quickest hours of the week. Um, probably because there's just so much to talk about, you know, in all the content. Um, mm. There is just so much to talk about. So should we, should we talk about really quickly then, uh, what, what have we learned um, this, this week? Who, who'd like to start? Who'd like to start? Go on, go on Beth. We're ladies first. Thank you very much. I, I, do you know, I, I was sort of racking my brains. Um, I think uh, we're learning stuff all the time, but the thing that sticks in my mind is really I, I did, um, I, I was on a, a Zoom call today, earlier this morning, with the School of Facilitation. And what I learned was some of the tricks, I suppose tricks is the wrong word, techniques mm -hmm. that you can use to enhance the experience of the learner using uh, virtual learning um, platforms like Zoom. So I'm not talking about e-learning, you know, um, as such, but how you can make your presentation online much more dynamic, much more interesting. And it, there was things that um, sort of plugins that you can use like second cameras to, to add interest. And I think that the one thing I kind of picked up from it more than anything was the, the the need for interest and visual interest online I think is so much greater than it necessarily is face to face you know my slides in, in a face to face setting are really they're there they're, they're not there to detract from me they're there just as a bit of a visual prompt whereas I think online you need that, that sort of visual stimulus to keep people interested more so than you do face to face. So it's got me thinking about how I design, I, if I'm honest, when I've delivered virtual training, it's been almost a sort of a pick up my slide deck from the, the face to face sessions and move them online. And I think there's, I think there's a difference in how we need to be presenting information online. So that was my learning. I'm going to go away and sort of review some of the, the ways that I deliver online training and try and hopefully make it a bit more visually um, interesting. Mm. And I think that's a key point and conversations I've had with L&B um, specialists uh, and providers as well recently is, you know, virtual learning is not necessarily taking your um, face-to-face your -face content and moving that online. It, it's, it's, it's a different skill. It's con fundamentally the content might be the same, but how you do that, I think there's a, there's a whole new skill base uh, for, yeah. for external providers like ourselves, but also internal L and D teams, there's there's going to be a whole new thing to learn uh, about how we do that because we can't. It's not a lift and drop into a, in, into a different way of doing it, different platform. Uh, there's, there's a whole new skill base to learn as well. How exciting is that, though? Very exciting. How exciting <laughs> is that to to learn new skills about something we've been doing yeah. for so long? Anyway, I love that. Love yeah, that. and not and not be, not be uh, frightened or threatened by it as well, but just take it as mm -hmm. as part of our own CPD yeah. too. Cool. Uh, Peter, what have you learned? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of a further paradigm shift because it's something that I've been thinking about. And uh, that was as I've been tendering for more mental health training. And that is, we were bounded when we do classroom training and we do it a distance away, we are bounded by delivering in times of days at a time. And I think actually we can deliver virtually if we shift our mindsets and we shift that of the clients as well depending on what they need but actually we could deliver more regular shorter sharper lessons and mm. classes and training and development and we're not bounded by outcomes of a day or half a day anymore mm -hmm. yeah those okay. those learning those learning start those learning sessions could be completely changed and we are unbounded by distance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is this actually happening or is this um, something that you're sort of uh, hoping for? Is, it, is that change already this happened? Is, 
no, this, this is something that I'm exploring in, in a tender proposal that I'm putting forward now. Okay, brilliant. Around, yeah. around mental health training. So rather than it being the, the traditional, I, I compete, I, I, I make no uh, bones about it. I, I compete with the mental health first aid solution, which is what's out there currently for, for many companies and many companies are choosing that, which is follows the format of two days, one day, half day. And um, I think that uh, that, certainly for that that is now being lifted and pushed into a virtual setting um and i think that actually a mental health solution it would be much better being half hour sessions hour sessions over a prolonged period of time to develop people and develop thinking over a period of time and that's something that i'm putting forward as a proposal yeah. which i know that my competitors can't compete with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so what I think about you Jeff? Uh, sorry just to for, just on Pete really quickly really quickly um, i think that kind of just in time for um, for time poor cash poor companies is is going to be really really important. It kind of and also because it's it's virtual as well as anytime any place anywhere. Um, and I think that's whether you're a provider or you're internal. I think that's definitely the way to go, regardless of whether that's virtual or face to face. Uh, for me, um, in a similar vein for you two actually, is the amount of research uh, that's been done in the last um, eleven weeks. So many people are learning so much at the moment, maybe because they've got the time. But also as well, um, you know, research bodies and, and organizations and businesses are really looking at themselves and really challenging. But also there's a lot of data coming out of that as well. So it's really fascinating the amount of, um, the amount of reports and, and studies that are coming out and, and support information. So my learning this week is, is kind of like um, dredging as much information, you know, just that you know, I'm really throwing my net wide, if you like. Um, and then kind of hauling in all that information. There's probably too much information out there to digest properly, uh, but it's it's really interesting to actually be part of that journey somehow um, and, and learn um, about, about what's going on. And then um, hopefully then uh, in, the, in the future, my customers will, will benefit from that learning as well, because I learn, I'll change, and it'll support um, learning and change for them too. You know, there's lies, damn lies and statistics, don't you? Yes, yeah, I do, yeah. Careful you take everything with a pinch of salt, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but if enough people are saying a similar thing, then there's going yeah. to be some truth in that, I guess. Okay, cool. So uh, we're coming towards the end of the podcast. Um, any, any final or closing thoughts from anybody about what we're up to? Um, no, are we just, done for this week? Just amazed we're into June already. And uh, after all the lovely weather, I had my log burner on last night and a blanket over my legs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm looking out the window and it's pouring with rain and I've got to go and collect some fixed bikes which is very disappointing because I was looking forward to getting out on my bike and I don't really fancy it. I even got hailed on last night walking the dog and it's <laughs> what June. What is going so. on? Crazy weather. What's going on? But the <laughs> lockdown <laughs> tan's still there, so fine. Yeah, it's not washed off yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, thanks for joining us um, again this week. Everybody, remember that you can listen to us on lots of different platforms. Um, remember to subscribe um, and share with everybody else. We will talk with you again next week. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Cheers, guys. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us on the Stronger for Business podcast. A final thought before we go, in the words of Henry Ford, anyone who stops learning is old, whether at 20 or 80. Anyone who keeps learning stays young. So stay young and join us next Friday for our next episode of the Stronger for Business podcast. Mm -hmm.